Hello everybody, it's Jay Roby. We're going to be continuing our exploration of uh, Fisher's opening strategies and this video is going to focus on the King's Gambit Accepted. Um, it's a match that took place between uh, Fisher and uh, Minnick Dragozub in the tournament in Vinkovki and I hope I pronounced that right. Um, but Fisher's playing white and he gets into the King's Gambit Accepted line and he's a very strong player with the King's Gambit Accepted. If you look at his database, I think he's only lost one game out of eight and I think the one loss that he suffered uh, to took place at a simul. Uh, so who knows exactly ha what happened there or how many people he was playing at the same time. Uh, but nonetheless, it wasn't a match that got his full attention. So the King's Gambit accepted by itself, um, you know, if we isolate that from just the King's Gambit in general, because the King's Gambit has a lot of variations, and we're going to be getting into those in a, a future video, but the King's Gambit accepted line, uh, white scores a 39.1% win, Black scores a 42.8% win, and the draw percentage is 18.1. Now, white doesn't have quite as healthy of a win percentage, but what really caught my attention was the draw percentage was quite low compared to other openings. So if you're going to be playing a match um, where you don't want to draw, if you're in a tournament or you, you know you're playing a match where you don't want to draw, the King's Gambit, um, you know, if you can get it down into those lines, uh, you can definitely have a good opportunity at winning or even losing. But your your chances of drawing are quite a bit less, so that's something to keep in mind. Now. Um, when you're looking up Fisher and the King's Gambit accepted or even just the general uh, King's Gambit opening, um, he's known by a lot of grandmasters as being, uh, you know, very, very, uh, a very interesting character with the opening. In fact, Kasparov said um, in one of his books that uh, when people like Fisher or Spassky or Bronstein were essaying the Gambit, um, they did so in a particularly violent mood. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of a, a flavor to uh, their attitude attitude towards the opening. So when they were uh, particularly violent, they wanted a really sharp attacking hammer type game, uh, they went into the gambit lines. So let's get into the match here. And it took place in 1968, and uh, Fisher's playing white. And for those of you who not are, aren't familiar with the gambit opening uh, moves, uh, they go as follows. Uh, white plays uh, king's pawn out to e4. Black responds uh, e5, and now white offers up the pawn as a gambit. And in this particular position, Minnick accepted, so we get into the uh, King's Gambit accepted line. And from here, Fisher played a move that's very common in his uh, King's Gambit accepted lines, and that's bishop to c4. Now you will notice that black has a king, or sorry, the queen, uh, bearing down here on a checking line, uh, but that can be blocked by knight to f3. And Knight to f3 is actually uh, uh, scores a better win percentage if it's played out before uh, bishop to c4. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Fisher preferred to bring out the bishop first. Um, so the match goes as follows. After the bishop comes out to c4, um, black plays uh, knight to e7. Now the knight looks a little bit odd in this position, but it serves a very important purpose of building up attack capabilities on d5. And it is actually one of the uh, recommended moves against the bishop's gambit in the king's gambit accepted. Um, so from here, Fisher develops his knight to c3. And I should stop here and note that one of the benefits of playing the bishop out uh, early is that white is allowed to develop quite quickly. And you're going to see how that takes shape here. Uh, so from this position, Minnick plays pawn to c6, further bringing up uh, attack capabilities here to d5. And Fisher develops knight now to f3. And Minnick plays now a strong pawn push uh, to d5. And you'll notice that he's got a lot of attackers uh, built up on the square. He's got the pawn supporting here, uh, the knight, and the queen. Now, Fisher could capture here with the pawn. Um, but it's really not that great of a move. And let's take a look at, at why that wouldn't be so great. So if Fisher captures with the pawn, um, black can come in now with its own pawn. And basically what black is doing is it's taking a C pawn and creating a new center pawn. And from here, um, you know, it's really not that great uh, for white to let that happen. Uh, so what Fisher does instead is uh, he peels his bishop back to b3, um, which we'll see in the, in the short future here that this is a very good square for this bishop. Um, so Fisher's saying, you know what, I don't want to go into that line um, because let's just go back once again and see if we can go even farther down that possibility here. So let's just do some capturing and see how it would end up uh, for white in this position. So if all the material is traded off, um, black simply uh, comes out a piece ahead. 
And that's why Fisher didn't want to get into that line. That's if you go all the way down the, the, the trading line. Um, but even if Fisher didn't go all the way down the trading line, let's say Fisher just went here. Um, Fisher could pull the bishop back to b3 in this position. Um, but now all of a sudden black has a center pawn here. And, um, you know, it's really not that great for white because black now is going to be able to have all these pieces uh, start come flying out on the board. So Fisher uh, completely uh, ignores that and pulls his bishop back to b b3. Now black captures his pawn and Fisher recaptures with the knight. And if you take a short snapshot of the board in this position, white's a whole lot better uh, than what would have happened if we would have went down some of the other variations. So from this position, black plays knight to d5, which is a nice spot for the knight currently. And Fisher brings his queen to e2. Black brings his bishop out now to e7, stopping any kind of uh, check, uh, discovered check by moving the knight. Fisher plays his pawn to c4 now, kicking this knight out of this square. Um, so black plays it to c7, and now Fisher moves his pawn up to d4. So you can see that white's central position is improving quite quickly here compared to black's. So from this position, black castles. Um, you'll notice probably that uh, Minnick was thinking of uh, bringing the rook out here and trying to capitalize on some kind of uh, position that still had Fisher's uh, queen uh, in front of the king. Fisher just brings the bishop out now, taking the pawn on f4. So the gambit pawn has been recaptured. Um, and that's another theme in Fisher's uh, King's Gambit accepted matches. You'll usually see him get that pawn back within the first 10 to 12 moves. Um, so he's equalized material here now. Black plays knight to e6. And Fisher just brings the bishop back now to uh, e3. Now let's take a moment and look at the board and how both uh, players fared in the opening. Um, and we'll start with Fisher. One of the first things you'll probably notice is that all of Fisher's minor pieces on the home rank have been developed. And the only pieces that he has left on the back ranks here are uh, the king and the rooks. And you'll also notice that his central position is really good, but more importantly, his pieces can be very fluid. And let's get into why that's the case. And we'll work our way from left to right. So the first piece here uh, that Fisher has is the bishop on b3. And what you'll notice about this bishop is that it has a lot of options available to it. So for example, if this pawn were to ever move, uh, Fisher would have a nice diagonal carving into the castled position. And also the bishop can fluidly come down to C2 giving access along another diagonal to the king side position as well as things shape up on the queen side the way Fisher would like he could bring the bishop and carve down into um, the uh, the back rank from that diagonal so it's a very nice bishop there um, the other bishop that Fisher has as well is a fluid piece because it can uh, immediately it's attacking along this diagonal but more importantly it's also got a uh, future potential of carving down on the queen side or coming down and opening up different access uh, diagonals uh, to different positions. Um, so the basic gist of Fisher's bishops here are that he has so many options available to swing the attack where he wants it um, that they're just very beautifully placed. And in fact, Fisher was a big fan of the bishops and he liked to kind of coordinate things to make them as useful as possible. And I think you can see here from this position that he's achieved that right off the bat. And he's also got his knights here that are impacting a lot of squares in the center of the board. So for example, the knight on e4 here is great grabbing a lot of squares in the area into the center of the board and uh, also uh, near his uh, home rank position and his other knight on f3 is also grabbing a lot of squares some of which sharing with the other knight which is always nice to have more than one attacker on a square so I've used green here to illustrate Fisher's position and options and we haven't even got into the queen or the castle position yet uh, but I, I think you can see that his center control and center options here are just beautiful now let's talk about his queen and his castle position Fisher hasn't castled yet, so if Fisher wants at some point uh, to swing the attack onto the king side, he could castle uh, queen side and uh, immediately have another attacker going down on the d file. Alternatively, if he wants to swing the attack towards uh, ripping into the castle position here, he still has the option of castling king side and opening up access immediately for the rook along the f file. So his uh, his decision not to castle too early here is very very. 
uh, very impressive because, you know, wherever he decides to attack, in one move he could bring a rook to bear on a key file and uh, contribute to that attack immediately. So that's very important here uh, when you're looking at Fisher's position. Now let's take a quick moment to look at his opponent's position, uh, which I think you'll agree with me is very inferior towards Fisher's. We have three pieces undeveloped here on the home rank, and while he does have a bishop here that's carving down on a couple diagonals and a knight, uh, really that's all he has, and in this position, Fisher secured the win relatively quickly. So I enjoyed going over the match. Hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, take care, and we'll see you next time.